Okay, I think we have everyone here. Uh, welcome all to the second of the National Science Policy Network's Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Committee's uh, webinar series for this year. The theme is making science accessible for all. And today's focus will be on disability inclusion and advocacy. Uh, my name is Annabella Linko, the past chair uh, for the DEI committee at NSPN. And I'm glad to be here to welcome you all to the space and conversation. Uh, I do wanna put down a couple of, of notes logistically. If you are um, in need or desire uh, captioning, you can turn on your closed captioning down below in your options. We will also be sharing messages throughout the uh, time here with the webinar. So to make sure you pay attention to any of those, uh, including if you have your own questions, feel free to send them via the Q&A box. You're more than welcome to do so anonymously as well. Um, if you're feeling a little shy with your questions. Uh, and I do want to make one little note. So if you're live tweeting or um, noting down the information here, we do have one small spelling error with uh, the handle for Alyssa Favarella. It should be at disabled STEM. So without the in in there. And again, we'll reiterate this uh, as we share socials for our esteemed speakers for today. Uh, without further ado, however, I want to kick us off with making sure uh, you know who's all uh, moderating and being involved in the conversation. So Alema, ah, Emily Algayer is a fifth year PhD candidate in neuroscience at the University of Cincinnati in Ohio. Her research explores the role of airway inflammation seen in asthma and post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, she's long been interested in how chronic inflammation affects mental health, both sociologically and biologically. She currently serves as the secretary at her university's chapter of NSPN. And uh, her work experiences as a student disabled in STEM has led her to a passion for advocacy and representation. We're ha happy to have her here in this space to kick off the conversation. And without further ado, I'll let Emily take the Thank you, Annabelle. Um, yeah, so next um, I will be introducing everybody to, oh, well, first I'm going to um, go over sort of why we're having this today. Um, so um, if we could go back to, yes, that slide. Um, so we just kind of wanted to do some background on sort of why this is worth talking about, probably preaching to the choir here. Um, <laughs> as far as the importance of representation and inclusion of scientists with disabilities. Um, just in general, 25% um, of Americans over the age of 18 identified as having a disability. Um, and more specific to uh, the STEM fields, um, in 2019, over 4.5 million people employed in science and engineering identified as having a disability, um, more so they have um, a higher unemployment rate than those without disability um, in these specific fields and also overall. And they are shown to receive uh, fewer research assistantships, internships, fellowships, scholarship grants. Um, and I think something, you know, uh, under discussed is that you know, disabilities, visible or invisible, um, anyone can develop a disability at any point in their lifetime. So this is relevant really to everyone. Um, so beyond that, um, I wanted to introduce our um, panelists for today. I'm really excited to hear what everybody is bringing. Um, first, I wanted to introduce Dr. Jennifer Surratt. Um, Dr. Surratt is an anti-ableism and disability justice expert who has advanced this work in academia as a professor and researcher in the corporate world as diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging consultant. Um, after obtaining her PhD at Emory University in interdisciplinary studies, um, she stayed on as a faculty member in the Center for the Study of Human Health 
where she taught classes on bioethics and disability, mental health and culture, uh, health and human rights, and health in incarcerated and institutionalized spaces. Uh, she has 19 academic publications and 10 op-eds on various topics to her specialty, intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, she did leave academia in December of 2021 to pursue DEIB full time. Um, she currently runs a small consultancy called Disruptive Inclusion, where she's developing and advancing what she calls universal, universal design for equity, uh, an approach to DEIB based on the disability architectural concept of universal design. Um, this approach aims to provide a framework for DEIB practitioners and supports to develop proactive universal approaches and programs that impact a range of marginalized communities. Um, so that's really cool. Um, and our next speaker is Alyssa Paparella. Um, Alyssa is currently a third year PhD candidate in the Cancer and Cell Biology program at Baylor College of Medicine. In 2019, Alyssa graduated from Sarah Lawrence College before pursuing an NIH prep program at the University of California, Davis. Alyssa is a National Science Foundation graduate research fellowship program recipient. Um, besides pursuing STEM, Alyssa has been actively involved in disability advocacy. Uh, in 2020, Alyssa created the Disabled in STEM platform, which host, is hosted across a website, Twitter, Instagram, in order to raise more awareness and create community. Um, throughout this through this platform, Alyssa has created a mentorship program, which is launching its third year and has partnered with Disabled in Higher Education to run a non-STEM mentorship program. Alyssa is an executive team member for Disabled in Higher Education and serves on Disability In's uh, Adv Advisory Council. Within her own institution, Alyssa is co-president for the Disability Club Got Spoons an event planner for a wellness program called BCM Life and serves on the Inclusion and Excellence Council. Through her work, Alyssa aims to continue conversations regarding accessibility. Alyssa strives to make STEM more inclusive for all throughout her career. And then finally, um, but not least, uh, Dr. Anita Marshall. Um, Dr. Anita Marshall is a geoscience education researcher with interest in disability inclusion academic and social engagement in STEM, and the cultural aspects of the geosciences. She is a lecturer in the Department of Geological Sciences at the University of Florida, Gainesville, and the Executive Director of the International Association of Geosciences Un Diversity, a nonprofit with the mission to improve inclusion in the geosciences for people with disabilities. Dr. Marshall also leads the geospace program uh, an inclusive field for students with disabilities and other marginalized identities. Her work is informed by her experience as a disabled geoscientist, a mentor of the Choctaw Nation of Ac Oklahoma, and her own non-traditional academic path. Um, so now that I have introduced the speakers, um, we're going to go into opening remarks. Um, so we'll go in the order that I introduced everyone. Um, you uh, can um, use your slides uh, if you have provided them to sort of discuss. Great, can I get screen sharing capabilities? Oh, you have my slides here. Um, hi everybody, thank you so much for having me. This is uh, such an important topic. Um, I even though I did interdisciplinary studies and ended up as a social scientist, I um, definitely dipped my toe into um, neuroscience quite heavily along the way. So, and, and uh, STEM is you know deep to my heart. Um, what I want to talk about just real briefly is um, what was mentioned in the introduction, which is. Um, this uh, concept that I've developed called a universal design for equity. And I see it as an integrative and proactive approach to inclusion. So as was mentioned, I've been working in the field of DEIB for um, quite a while, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And along the way, I've noticed um, a couple of weaknesses in the field, and one being that 
it's been largely reactive. So the field was started in the 60s in the wake of affirmative action policies and laws and um, equal opportunity work. And it kind of chugged along for a while, mainly um, emerging in moments when organizations had internal complaints or problems. And then, of course, in 2020, um, with the George Floyd murder and the racial justice protest, it emerged again and has been a topic of conversation since. And what we're seeing in the field right now is that a lot of people are coming out and talking about how well you know we had this great surge of interest but there really hasn't been continued support for increasing diversity and equity in 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 anywhere right in, in higher education in organizations in scientific institutes i actually have um, a scientific institute on my client list right now and so i started really thinking about this um, and and I noticed that as I interacted with clients, I started talking about universal design a whole lot. Um, and so if we can go to the next slide. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar, universal design is an architectural concept that emerged in the late 80s, early 90s, I believe, um, in an effort to provide a framework to build spaces and places to be as accessible as possible to as many people as possible without introducing new barriers to anyone. So curb cuts, which you see here as um, on the screen, you see an image of a curb cut, which is a dip in the curb that allows people to access the sidewalk from the street via a small ramp. And curb cuts are a great example of a universally designed feature because although it was initially intended for people who use wheelchairs, it's helpful for people who have strollers or carts or skateboards or bikes or the elderly and have a hard time stepping up. Um, but there really isn't anybody who is who has additional difficulty because of a curb cut. And so I started really thinking about how this is the way that that inclusion and diversity really should be for um, for organizational culture and thinking a lot about that. So universal design has seven main um, for, uh, principles that guide the architecture, right? So it's, it's equitable use, flexibility in use, simple and intuitive use, perceptible information, tolerance for error, low physical effort, and size and space for approach and use. And you know, obviously these are very heavily architectural and I've translated these into DEI and I've written an op-ed about that. I'm happy to share that. Um, but really I see this as a perspective shift. So if we take a design approach to creating inclusive culture, then it requires us to be proactive. Um, it also is really good at addressing intersectionality. So a lot of um, efforts to increase diversity and equity and inclusion are, uh, you know, let's do these anti-racist efforts, let's do these anti-ableist efforts, let's do these, you know, anti-sexist efforts, whatever the case may be. And a lot of times they don't necessarily overlap or speak to each other. Sometimes they do just by default, but a lot that's not how they're done by design. And so I really am encouraging people to think about taking a universal design approach when thinking about access and equity in their particular culture. For, so for this um, case, it would be for um, STEM communities and STEM programs. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, so when I talk about using a universal design for equity, what I really am talking about is thinking about how to predict potential barriers um, for access to a community or to a position or to whatever. So uh, are there infrastructural barriers? For sure, I need to think about that. But is our language preventing people from accessing this particular site? Does everybody have the necessary information that they need in order to access this space? Things like that. Um, so it also helps 
determine solutions for a range of people and their multiple identities. So what may be a barrier for people of color? What may be a barrier for people who um, identify as having a physical disability, a sensory disability, an intellectual or cognitive disability for women, for LGBT, you know, just kind of, and then thinking about solutions that kind of address this for a range of people. And this type of thinking is a way to integrate inclusion and equity throughout an organization rather than having it to the side. It also communicates that accessibility and inclusion is central to the mission and to the whole approach of the culture or of the organization. And by default, we'll just help everybody feel safer and more comfortable and support everybody's needs. What's really important to keep in mind about a universal design approach, whether we're talking about it for architecture or there's a lot of universal design for learning approaches or this approach for equity, it doesn't negate the need for specific accommodations or access needs, um, but it reduces the likelihood of of individualized accommodations and access. Um, and so, and then also by predicting and creating an inclusive environment, it hopefully helps people feel more comfortable asking for more um, specific accommodations or needs. So that's kind of the approach that I, I am taking. I would love to hear your questions about the approach and then also some thoughts about um, applying this to a STEM community. So. I just have a last slide that's like, thank you, <laughs> which we're welcome to show, but that's it for my introductory comments. Um, again, thank you so much. I forgot to mention my pronouns are she, her, hers. And as a visual descriptor, I'm a white woman wearing glasses. I have dark brown hair that goes to about my shoulders. I'm wearing a blue shirt and I'm in front of a gray background that has my company Disruptive Inclusion up in the corner with my name and the email address for the company. Um, so with that, I'll pass it along. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciated that background and we'll definitely have the chance to do um, some Q&A and discussion about that as we go through um, all the um, opening remarks um, or after we're done with those. So the next um, opening remarks are going to be from Alyssa. Um, the next slide should be you. Yep. Hi, everybody. First off, thank you so much for having me here today. So my name is Alyssa Paparella. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a white woman. I have a long brown hair that's currently tied back in a ponytail and over my one shoulder. I have a purple shirt on and my background is blurred because it's an office that's not mine. So just want to keep that confidential for them. So I interpreted this as my opening remarks, telling you a bit about my journey and how I got to be where I am today. So as mentioned in my lovely introduction, I'm currently a third year PhD candidate at Baylor College of Medicine, and that has been a very challenging path for me to get to where I am at today. I am somebody who has multiple disabilities, but most commonly I'm seen walking around with my cane. So my cane is purple. You guys can tell purple is my favorite color. So I'm always a fan of making mobility aids and interpreting your disability as part of your identity. So I'm happy to use a purple cane and show that disability could have personality associated with it. So during the pandemic, when we were all facing what the closest we've gotten to a lockdown, I founded the Disabled in STEM movement. So the reason that I really founded this movement is because I felt very isolated about my experiences thus far in STEM. So I was really navigating and struggling trying to find a mentor or anybody who was disabled and could relate to my experiences. At the time, I was receiving invitations and acceptances for graduate schools, but I was finding it very challenging to see, does anybody else look like me at any of these institutions? And how do I turn to make these decisions without being truly informed. So I don't want anybody else to struggle like how I did. So I decided to create this movement on Twitter and see what it blossomed into. And since then it really has grown, which is obvious because I'm here today and that says something. So my Twitter for the Disabled in STEM movement is at Disabled STEM. And I also have a personal Twitter in my name, which is at Alyssa Paparello. So through my platform, I primarily seek to create community and representation and raise awareness of these conversations. Because often when we talk about STEM, we don't think about disability being part of diversity, but as discussed previously, it is so intersectional to so many identities. So one of the things I've done through my disabled in STEM 
program is offer a mentorship program, which is now recruiting for its third year. So that's very exciting because I did not have a mentor when I was navigating this, and I would love for other people to not have to feel how I felt. Additionally, I also am an executive team member at Disabled in Higher Ed. So around the time when I was creating the Disabled in STEM movement, I got together with a few other people through Twitter, and we founded the Disabled in Higher Education platform because I want education to be accessible for everybody, not just STEM. STEM happens to be my passion and what I'm interested in. And through Disabled in Higher Education, I've also launched their mentorship program and work for a mentorship program for um, non-STEM people. So through this, I find I've really been focused on my advocacy work so far. It is definitely difficult navigating STEM as a disabled scientist and being told sometimes that you're a better advocate than you are a scientist. I'm happy to talk about any of these more personal tidbits or any questions you guys have. And thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you, Alyssa. I've definitely been following your Twitter like since the beginning. So I'm very excited to meet you. <laughs> um, and I'm pretty sure I signed up for the mentorship program. That is just such a great idea because it's just so hard, you know, <laughs> believing that you, you belong. Um, it is. Someone with disability. So that's really great that you're doing that. Uh, I'm very excited about all the panelists today. I've just been fangirling in preparation for this. Um, <laughs> and um, so our next speaker is Dr. Marshall. Um, if you would like to take it away with your opening remarks. Sure, thanks for having me. So I just did the one slide. I'm never sure what to do on these like intro things for panels, um, uh, but you gave me a really nice introduction earlier. Um, I am the executive director of the International Association for Geoscience Diversity, the IAGD.org. Um, we also have a Twitter handle. Um, if you want to follow the IAGD, we're at Accessible Geo, uh, and that's on all platforms, so we're really easy to find. Um, my research areas are geoscience education, disability in STEM and academia, barriers to diversity in the geosciences, and my traditional uh, geology background is in volcano geophysics. So uh, quite a, a widespread there. Um, I have a physical disability uh, from a, a car accident a number of years ago, uh, and which has also resulted in pretty significant chronic fatigue, which needless to say, if you're in a field-oriented science is a significant barrier. Um, I'm also a member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, which I uh, proudly integrate into my philosophies on how I design my courses and my uh, field, field work. Um, yeah, and I'm on Twitter at Baking Soda Volk, or like I said, the IGD is on there uh, at Accessible Geo. Uh, so I just thought I'd share a few photos here, a little bit about what the IGD does and some of the work that I do in my uh, accessible field courses. So the International Association for Geoscience Diversity is a 501c3 nonprofit. We're completely volunteer run. Uh, so, and we are fueled by donations and grants. So um, all the work we do is funded in most part by, you know, people throwing a few dollars at us here and there during our fundraising drives. And we're able to do some really great stuff with that. Um, uh, we just launched a student pathways grant program where student geoscience students with disabilities uh, can get some money to help support them in whatever extra things they need to get through their degree. Um, this has been wildly popular and we, we are overwhelmed by the number of uh, submissions that we've been getting. Uh, since it launched last year. So we're really ramping up our fundraising this year to try to support more students because the need greatly outweighs our current pot of money on that. But, you know, I, I'm just so happy that we've been able to do that tangible uh, means of supporting people with disabilities rather than, you know, just talking theory or talking like, here's what people can do to make a classroom more accessible. I think it's really meaningful to be able to tangibly support um, individuals with disabilities. So um, in the uh, tall skinny picture on the bottom, this picture was taken at one of our geoscience conferences. Uh, we're wearing our IAGD shirts that say the future is inclusive uh, while we ogle a T-Rex skeleton because we're geo nerds. Um, uh, that's me and some of our volunteers that, that work on our uh, 
uh, our board. Um, the other two smaller insets are from some of our accessible field courses that we run. Uh, and we, the field courses are sort of a, our signature thing at the IAGD. Um, they are a way to demonstrate to other geoscience practitioners um, essentially a better way to run field courses, a more inclusive way to, to do field work and to demonstrate that the physicality that's involved in a lot of natural science field work is not part of the science that's being done. It's this ableist trapping that's been sort of overlaid on top of it. And, um, you know, we, we use these field courses to really demonstrate that you can do great science and get out there and really enjoy, you know, what the earth has to offer without, you know, hiking 20 miles through the wilderness and you can still have these great experiences. Um, the, the larger picture on top is from the geospace program. So uh, this is something that's NSF National Science Foundation funded. It's a program, it's a two week field course in Northern Arizona designed for uh, people with disabilities and other marginalized identities. We have a online and fully virtual uh, participation option because to me, like you cannot call something accessible and not have a virtual option. Uh, there are just so many reasons why people can't travel. And, you know, you can't say, oh, I run an accessible field course if you're still requiring people to physically be there. So needless to say, this is pretty challenging to come up with a meaningful way to engage our virtual cohort, but we do this through a planetary science lens. So we run them like NASA science missions and our virtual students are mission control. They do a lot of data analysis. They do satellite imagery. Um, and then they, they build um, mission control reports, which are used to determine what the in-person students are going to do in the field that day, or our astronauts, as they tend to call them. And so it's a very close collaboration. And then we work very hard to select sites that have a range of physical participation modes. So whether you get five feet from the van or all the way up a volcano, there's amazing science for you to do and something for you to contribute meaningfully to what's going on in the field. Um, so uh, it's um, something I'm really proud of. And one of the big things about geospace is, and a lot of my projects is that I really use a disability, uh, equity and disability justice centered lens, uh, which is very disruptive in science spaces. Um, and, you know, we build everything. Geospace was built with uh, me and a bunch of my disabled geo friends that had managed to make it through the gauntlet and get in positions of, you know, academic privilege. And so we designed this field course as the field course we would have wanted to see uh, when we were students. Like if we if we could build a program from scratch by disabled folks, for disabled folks, what would that look like? And it's so amazing that we were funded to do this and that we get to see this, uh, you know, this amazing program materialize. And it's, it's, so, it's so meaningful to us and the students involved to be able to see this cohort and build this community of uh, disabled folks in the geosciences at all levels uh, to really show that you're not the only one out there you know, we're, we're out here, we're doing this and uh, we can, we can make things better for the group coming up behind us. So yeah, that's all. Thank you so much. That is so wildly cool. That's like, um, you know, at an event where you would brainstorm, like you were saying, like an excess, like, what would you do if you were given the opportunity to create this and then it, it exists, like you created it. That's, immensely cool to me. That's awesome. Um, thank you guys for um, your opening remarks. Uh, so we're going to move on to a Q&A session. So um, you can submit questions. There is like a little Q&A um, button um, at the bottom. And we already have had one question asked. Um, and, you know, um, or you can upvote uh, someone else's question if you also want to see it. Uh, we also have moderator questions, yes. 
Um, so while we wait for some um, questions to come up in the Q&A, um, I will just go ahead and start uh, with a question to each of you guys um, and ask um, what, how you define uh, disability and how the lack of inclusion or access play out in STEM or the workplace uh, more generally. So we'll go again in the order of um, the way we did the opening remarks and you know answer the question from how you see it. Dang, that's a, that's a hard question. I always ask my students this question, what is this, or like when I'm doing workshops, I'm, what is disability? And um, hoping that nobody asks me to define it myself because uh, you know it's it's an identity that is basically based on um, sociocultural, based in opposition to sociocultural determinations of what bodies and minds should be doing based on, uh, you know, kind of what our natural capabilities are and um, differences associated with that. I also consider disability to be a cultural identity um, and one that provides a lot of um, unique insight and perspectives to the world uh, in the way that we need to uh, understand more about. Um, what was the second part of the question? <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's just sort of how you see the lack of inclusion or access play mm. out in STEM. So my particular area of expertise is neurodiversity and intellectual and developmental disabilities. And I think that um, historically, even when we talk about disabilities like autism, which have you know a range of intellectual capabilities with it, um, these this category of disability is um, always associated with uh, an assumption that, in terms of scholarly work, there's nowhere to go. There's limitations. There's significant limitations. Um, and that there's such a rigorous way to think in science and math that um, that having neurodiverse individuals involved is not going to work well. Alternatively, we have the actually the very opposite stereotype that happens that everyone who is autistic should be a scientist because, you know, of computerized thinking and all of these other um stereotypes. So we have these two sort of competing analogies, or, or I'm sorry, the um, assumptions that um, are hard to get past in order to just find a space that'll let you be in science and math and, and, and um, STEM spaces. Um, however, I think that there is an incredible amount of creativity in STEM and having the type of mind that works differently is a unique strength that can help think through problems from a perspective that isn't in the box and can really lead to creative research strategies and data analysis outcomes and interpretation of data and ways to um, communicate about what your data is saying. So it's a real um, the stigmas associated with neurodiverse identities is can be a real challenge to overcome, but if we can overcome them, then I think that science will take us in some really amazing ways because of these unique perspectives that get added. Um, of course, the, when we talk about other kinds of disabilities, sensory disabilities, physical disabilities, those often get conflated with intellectual disabilities, <laughs> which is really frustrating, right? Um, and we don't want to create a hierarchy of disability that, oh, this disabled person can do this, but this disabled person can do can, cannot, right? Um, and we also don't want to set up a situation where people with, you know, for example, who use a wheelchair are like, no, 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 I'm not that kind of disabled because that also creates a hierarchy. So um, I'm kind of wandering a little off topic a little bit now, but um, I think that, you know, basically stigma of, of what people with disabilities are and aren't quote unquote capable of is the biggest barrier to STEM inclusion. Thank you so much. Um, Alyssa, do you have an answer? Yeah, sure. So I get a lot of people that ask me, am I disabled? Can I be part of disabled in STEM? 
And I always find that a very difficult question to answer. So my personal belief is if you feel that you are disabled, then you're welcome to use the term disability. I think as we touched on is having a diagnosis of disability is also rooted in privilege because it's not access everybody could get. It requires expenses. It requires sometimes traveling. It requires a doctor to believe you and your experiences, which is not always as easy as people would think. So I believe that disability is all encompassing. And if you believe that you were disabled, that you're welcome to use the term. I'm not here to police who is disabled and who isn't. Looking at me, you would probably say, I'm not disabled. But then if you see me use a cane, you may say, oh, wow, maybe she is disabled. But then if you see me walk without my cane, people are like, oh, you're not really that disabled. So one of the things about understanding disability is disability is so diverse, even within the same diagnosis. So two people could be diagnosed, for example, with ADHD, and they may require different accommodations to fit their needs. So understanding that disability is not one stoic thing that fits everybody is also part of the understanding of what is the definition of disability and how do we move forward for inclusion. In terms of STEM inclusion, I think one of the barriers is, is just not even feeling like it's a safe environment to disclose that you have a disability. So I have to say that when I started, it was definitely difficult to even bring up the point that I am disabled. But then when I started using a cane, it was much more obvious to people of like, oh, you are actually disabled, but I shouldn't have to use a mobility aid in order for people to understand that I am disabled. And I do think within STEM access and inclusion in itself is it's much more difficult for people with physical disabilities, whether they're physical enough that you could see or physical for them themselves, it's often more taboo because they're assuming that they have to make actual changes, such as if you guys think of a lab bench, your typical lab bench is pretty high up, which isn't gonna fit somebody, for example, who's in a wheelchair. How does that address their access needs? So oftentimes because of the challenges for somebody with a physical disability, they tend to kind of be swept to the side and say, oh, okay, like, and you don't get much access needs met, at least in my experience and those that I have talked to before, but that's not saying that it's not as valid. Everybody with a disability is valid. Your accommodations are valid. You deserve to have equal access, but fighting for that access is still a challenge for all of us. And that's why we have the community to depend on each other and learn from each other. So I'm seen as one of the advocates for disabled in STEM, but I'm also still learning from everybody because my disability and my experience is also just my own. So learning from others, especially those of intersectional identities and voices, you're going to learn a lot more about understanding how disability is perceived and how we could start to make solid changes to work towards inclusion for all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and also, Dr. Marshall, um, you know, you're, you as well, I do see some Q&A. Um, and so definitely you know, I want to get to those questions. We'll do those next, especially Madeline. I love your question and the anonymous question um, relates to it very similarly. So um, we'll get Dr. Marshall's answer to, you know, how you define um, disability and what, how you see lack of inclusion and access play out in your field. Yeah, um, I think uh, one of the things we really haven't touched on is that how you define disability is not straightforward. Um, there are social cultural definitions of dis disability. There are medical definitions of disability. And a lot of times I think some of the confusion comes in is because somebody may be asking through one framework and somebody's answering through another framework. And so, you know, like uh, one of my friends describes it as, uh, are, are you lowercase or uppercase disabled? Right. And she's basically talking about like, is it, you know, are you using more like an identity based model? It's part of your identity. Um, or are you someone with a disability uh, from like the medical model where like you don't really consider yourself like you don't consider your disability part of your uh, social cultural identity, uh, more of just like your medical history. Right. So there's there's different ways to, to define disability and you know, one of the questions I get all the time, people want me to like audit their course or audit their field program. And they always ask me, so is it accessible? And my question to them is always for who? Like, who, who are we talking about, right? It's not, we're not like, 
disability, like any identity, is not a monolith. And there's so many different parameters and so many considerations. And like, you know, you, you brought up a, a minute ago it, that changes even inside a diagnosis, even for the same person day to day, my disability plays out very differently depending on the environment and the circumstances. One of the challenges we have in a field-based science is that like, if you saw me on campus, unless I'm having one of my chronic fatigue crashes, like I don't really look disabled if I'm wearing long pants and you can't see how just totally wrecked my legs are, but like, I don't look disabled and I can get around just fine on campus, but you put me out in the field where, you know, we go a lot in my discipline, all of a sudden I am like very disabled out there. And, you know, a lot of times it's circumstantial, it's environmental, you know, and so I think that's challenging too on like, you know, whether you identify as disabled or are you just a person with a disability, you know, it, it, it all depends on how you define it. Um, I think the way it plays out in science is uh, there's this prevailing culture that um, of just, there's so much stigma around disability that people are so people are terrified to be associated with that word, especially in, in science and technology disciplines. So, you know, people work very hard to hide it, push it to the side, you know, downplay it or overwork to compensate, which is a problem I really struggle with where like you try to be like the best of the best at everything so that they don't focus on the fact that you've, you've got a disability. Um, you know, and, and all that stuff's problematic. And what happens is over time, whether you're being intentionally, you know, ableist, whether you're saying like, it doesn't matter if you look somebody in the face and say, you can't participate because you're disabled. It's the culture, right? That sort of pushes people out that says, you know, maybe this isn't for me. Like it may be, you know, and so I think a lot of times in in STEM disciplines, that's what happens is, is, you know, before it even gets to the very in your face kind of ableism, there's that prevailing culture that says, maybe this isn't for you. And I think that's a real challenge. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. I think, um, there are, there are, there are so many papers and like books written about disability and how it is perceived, how individuals with disabilities perceive the different models of disability. It is, such a nuanced question, but um, I really appreciate everyone's sort of responses. Um, I don't, can you guys see the um, Q&A? Um, so I guess these two questions, I don't want to lump them together um, because I think they both deserve their own uh, responses. But um, as far as, you know, the point made that uh, academic, academia um, in work rooted in capitalism and productivity. Um, I think so many people see disability accommodation as a burden um, and that, and you were touching on that, Dr. Marshall, um, with feeling like you need to, 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 I don't know, to maybe convey that you're worth the investment, which should not be uh, what it is because, um, I mean, some of the best, care for disability is um, preventative, especially like, you know, if I've got a chronic inflammatory illness, like the time to do something is before it's flaring up. Um, but the only time, you know, my advisors care is when the flare up is happening. <laughs> so if until I've pushed myself to the edge, um, that's when maybe they'll acknowledge something's happened rather than accommodating preventative measures. Um, so I guess the question here, what, what would we change about academia um, to accommodate disabilities that maybe would be perceived as sort of being less efficient um, and sort of con conveying that, that, that we belong here? <laughs> um, and anybody can answer that. Um, I'm happy to start because I think about this a lot. Um, the sort of neoliberal slant on academia is one of the main reasons I left. <laughs> so um, that's it's it's a it's a real concern for me. The pace of academia, the um, 
the the attitude of perfection and advancement and being the top of your field and all of this stuff, the push, push, push towards all of that is really, um, it's really frustrating and disallows sort of the, the, the creative slow process of thinking and solutioning that I think is how, how most of us who go into academia and to science would want to be, right? We want to be able to take our time and really explore problems and, you know, kind of brainstorm different ways to solve that problem, answer that question, whatever the case may be. But we're bombarded with grant applications and new courses and advising and mentoring. And, and all of these things are like wonderful parts of the job in and of their own selves, but it's becoming more difficult to manage. Um, I, of course, will answer this question by saying a universal design approach. Um, you know, I used to give um, workshops at Emory on how to create a universally designed class. And I would definitely always get attendees who push back heavily on it on, um, you know, because I would include everything as, you know, like, right now I'm sitting on a Swiss ball. Like if you need to like sit on something and bounce during class, if you need to get up and walk around, what up, like whatever, like think about what the end result is, right? What is the core of this class? I want to teach you these things. I want you to demonstrate you're learning these things because otherwise I need to shift what I'm doing, right? Because my main goal is your learning. Um, and so all the other stuff to me is fluff. And so I would definitely get people being like, yeah, but when, when you leave college and go out into the real world, you can't pace around. You can't lay down on the floor in the middle of the day if you want to. And, you know, my response is why not? Right. Why not? Um, and also we definitely, if we're somebody who isn't super social, we're not going to go into, we're not going to seek out roles that involve you talking to people all day, every day. You know, like we have a little, like we have self expertise and we're able to say like, this is my interest. Um, I don't, I, I don't like, or can't do, or won't do these certain things. So I'm not going to look for jobs and professions that are those things. But if I want to be, for example, in the field, um, and there is nothing about being in the field that I don't like, um, and that doesn't match my, my personal passions and abilities and things that I want to thrive and learn from, then I should be able to do that. Um, and a lot, you know, sometimes the accommodations are, you know, at, living with a disability, you're constantly finding your own solutions to problems, right? And so using that self-expertise should be seen as a strength and as a resource. And, um, you know, I, although I would create my courses and everything I did as a professor to be as accessible as possible, when I got those, you know, accommodation letters, I would always be like, you just tell me what you need because I want you to learn and I am recording my classes. So if you need to stay home because you're having a flare up or whatever the case may be, I don't care. Like anyways, um, so that basically I just think be a good person, try to make things as accessible. Don't introduce barriers that are unnecessary just because it's the status quo um, and work with people. Um, does anybody else want to take a stab at that question? Yeah, I just wanted to add that, you know, I think that this is, you know, this exactly, yeah, I think in terms of what needs to change in like STEM and academia, like uh, there are some days I feel like, you know, burn it all to the ground is pretty much the only solution. <laughs> but, um, you know, in general, I think we need to be able to detach the science or the academic pursuits from the ableism and the, you know, the capitalism that's sort of wrapped around it and all tangled up in it. Because, you know, I think that's where the hangup happens. A lot of times the things that act as barriers aren't the science part. It's, it's not the actual science part. It's all the trappings and all the like social cultural baggage and all that that's tied up in it that actually act as barriers so you know I think taking a hard look at your programs and your courses and and you know for unnecessary 
barriers to participation, I think that's a great place to start. Alyssa, do you want to say something? I guess I could speak to part of the question that's talking about working at a slower pace because I do work at a slower pace and that's just inherent. I made that pretty clear when I was rotating with um, trying to find a lab and some labs were not interested in that. They want that they have to push their grants forward and they don't want somebody who's going to be more of a burden than anything else. But um, my biggest advice and piece of that is to try and inform people as soon as possible and put it on them of, yeah, this is something I'm dealing with. I know how to work best. I understand my limitations. How can we work together through these limitations in order to reach our common goal, whether that's publishing, getting a grant done. I think acknowledging and knowing yourself best and knowing that, oh, this may be a limitation is understanding that's what disability is for you, but that doesn't mean that you're worth less or that you're not, you shouldn't be able to have the same equal access. So surrounding yourself with people or finding the right allies that are understanding of it is super important. Important. I mean, my, my PIs are both aware that, yeah, it may take me longer to get my PhD, but that's okay. My thesis advisory committee is also aware of my limitations and struggles. Is that something I necessarily have to share with them? No, but do I feel the pressure to share with them in order for them to understand that, yeah, I might not have as much data as someone else in my year? Yeah, and I wish I didn't have to feel that I have to be like, oh yeah, by the way, I'm going for these medical procedures. I'm doing this and that, but it's kind of inherent because otherwise you're seen as the slower pace is not great for academia, but I think the more that we openly talk about it and push back against it is one way we could start to make changes because I don't think that many people are aware of it as PIs. So raising these conversations and having them is a great way to at least start to see who's going to be supportive, whether they understand it or not is different, but as long as they feel comfortable enough to engage in a conversation and listen to these perspectives is a great way to move towards change. I just noticed there was a, a comment that came in, a question that came uh -huh. in that is exactly what I was going to add to I Alyssa, <laughs> is that I have made a habit of asking for what I need in my grants. Mm -hmm. If you need extra time, you read that in the budget. If you need helpers because you can't physically do something, write it in the budget, right? And a lot of times the funding agencies are, well, at least NSF has been very accommodating for that. Like they, they're like, oh yeah, there's also a specific fund that NSF has for, um, say you have a grant and you have a student with a disability that you want to bring on the grant and you need some sort of specialized equipment or something specific to accommodate that student in your lab, um, you can apply to this extra fund that NSF has um, and uh, for, for accommodation needs. So there are resources out there to make that extra time and those extra things that cost money, you know, something you can build into a budget. That was actually going to be, I wanted to ask you, you two, because you're more familiar with like STEM grants and stuff that I know that diversity is an increasing focus for granting agencies that they're really wanting to funnel money towards more diverse teams and whether or not that um, you can like write that in. So I'm so happy to hear that. that that's great. Yeah, and I think that um, actually transitions well into the next question too. Um, so anonymous question, uh, I'm so happy to be here to learn. I work in science policy around synthetic biology and engineering biology. Um, I'm trying to think about how my discipline can better integrate the principles of universal access. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how bench work, pipetting, et cetera, can incorporate principles, principles of universal access and design, or is it a better approach to recognize that the physical actions of pipetting and running experiments are different from the actual work of being a scientist, the making hypotheses, analyzing data, et cetera? I think all of you have touched on some part of that question, but if you... Um, want to sort of more directly respond to that. Um, any of you can. I can start because I am a scientist at the bench that struggles with joint pain when it comes to pipetting, opening tubes and everything. So 
what I made very clear when I was talking to PIs is like, yes, you may have pipettes, but I'm probably going to need a more ergonomic and one that fits my specific needs. I wish I could say there was one pipette that was the best and that every lab should have because that would be great. But unfortunately, I haven't found one. So what I did was I tested a bunch and I found the ones that were easiest to me. There's also the option that I think would be great if labs could start having more electronic pipettes. So it's not as much physically demanding on the joints of the hand in itself. So that's a great alternative. And then even some universal principle designs are there like um, tube openers actually that they have. So, you know, when you're doing experiments and have numerous Eppendorf tubes to open, it definitely is painful for people who struggle with joint pain. So having all of those resources available or even having easy to open tubes would be a great way to start to create an inclusive environment, even if somebody doesn't necessarily need it. And also it's just easier on everyone's hands, but there definitely is a difficult time when it comes to bench work of being a disabled scientist, but I want my training as a disabled scientist to be all encompassing. I don't want to just have to say, oh, I can make the hypotheses and do all of that and the data analysis. I want my hands on and trying the best that I could, but I am in a place where I'm thankful that I do have the support of my lab mates. So if I start a three-day experiment and I start flaring and being like, I'm not able to do this, most of the time somebody is willing and able to step forward and really collaborate and help me when I need it. And I think that's one of the most important things is just making sure that the environment is supportive enough where somebody could say what their challenges and barriers are and how can we work to move forward of what can we do to address this? Is there something we could buy? Is there something that we could do to support you? And that's kind of how I've tackled it as a PhD student myself. Thank you. Um, do either of you two also want to address that question or um, I, yeah, as someone with a, a rheumatic disease, got to say some PCRs have taken a number on me. <laughs> um, I think. Um, I, I just I kind of yes. want to, sorry, I just yeah. wanted to say something. Um, and I really like Alyssa, your response to that, particularly talking about having the supportive lab mates, because um, one of the things that I think one of the main lessons that the disability community can teach to the world is that we're not independent beings, we're highly interdependent and we're just interdependent to in different times and to different levels at different spaces. And, you know, so relying on each other for help in different situations is part of being human. And if we kind of have this wider understanding that independence is a myth, then hopefully it can create a more collaborative environment like you're experiencing with your lab. Yeah, someone has said to me, um, like the best accommodation they've ever received was redundancy for them, like the ability to have someone take over. And I think we're having a big issue with that now as, you know, labs are getting smaller, sort of the number of people being hired or smaller, that's kind of an issue. My lab is three people in the lab plus a PI um, and each of us has our own project. Um, and that has been, a huge barrier to access for me. So I think that that's an underestimated thing and something that helps with everybody. Um, so that would be a universal almost design um, in access that everybody feeling supported helps everyone, not just people with disabilities. Um, and uh, Reza asked a question. I'm not sure what PWD means. Um, have you noticed a shift in unemployment in PWD as employers become more enlightened? Um, uh, PWD is people with disabilities. It's common shorthand in like okay. grant applications. Um, um, yeah. I've not written a grant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I can I can start start on this one. Um, yeah. The the progress has been very slow, uh, but it is there. Um, you can. Uh, when the numbers are available, you can see it. One of the challenges in tracking this is that very few people actually track this metric. Um, in the geosciences, this has been especially challenging. The one group that used to regularly do surveys about uh, demographics in the geosciences across all identities, they got rid of the disability category a few years ago. So, you know, it's really 
it's really hard to track this stuff. But when you look nationally, um, you know, when the National Science Foundation does these big surveys and that sort of thing, the numbers are are slowly increasing. And a lot of that is because, you know, these pathways are ever so slightly, you know, opening up. Um, there was a huge uptick in disability participation during the pandemic because um, people with disabilities were given more opportunities to participate in jobs that they had never had access to before by remote participation. It was revolutionary. Um, and, you know, a lot of a lot of those people have been able to keep those jobs and keep them remote post pandemic. And so those people are in the job market now because of that radical shift in how we operate and how we do our jobs. And I think to me, that's also one of the most heartbreaking things for me to see how many companies have done this total whiplash on uh, the remote access where they're like, oh, pandemic over, back to the way it was. And for you know some folks with disabilities, that's heartbreaking because for a few, you know, for this brief moment in time, you know, there was access at a level that many people had never experienced before. You know, they'd been able to access spaces that had never been available to them, conferences and professional development opportunities and jobs. Um, and, you know, it's it's very disheartening to me to see so many people immediately roll that back uh, now that things are back to normal. Um, and, you know, we're just, we're, you know, yeah, the pandemic is, you know, it's awful, but there were some really good things that it's a shame that they're being thrown out, you know, in this desire to, to move on and move past. And again, that goes back to the whole capitalist trappings of, of how this works and, you know, this overriding desire to, to blow past anything negative and not, you know, not learn from anything and just keep plowing through the way we always have. But, you know, I, I really hope that some of these virtual options and some of the accommodation opportunities and lessons that were learned during the pandemic can stick around in some of these spaces because it, it makes a big difference. It was a wild irony of the pandemic, the accessibility that I had um, and the fear. <laughs> the <laughs> dichotomy <laughs> of the the significant access improvements and also yeah. the just incredible isolation was this it was weird <laughs> yeah um but i definitely can relate to that um so that was kind of all the questions um so we will have each of the speakers kind of give some concluding thoughts um and then we'll have an outro from annabelle so um we'll go ahead and go through uh, again in the order of the introduction starting with dr sarah why am I always first? <laughs> <laughs> Do we get to blame um, that on this? No. <laughs> um, you know, I I think I I'm living in a moment of hope for inclusion because I'm seeing that anti-ableism and disability justice is an increasing conversation in the spaces that I'm navigating. Um, and like I said earlier, I think we can't think about inclusion without centering disability. And um, you're really doing yourself a disservice if you're not taking a critical look at your structures and your systems and your cultures and um, figuring out how to break down barriers that exclude people with, with disabilities. Um, and so um, I'm happy to see panels like this and more attention to it. And you two are doing amazing work to raise awareness. And um, I mean, your class sounds awesome. I want to join it. I just, <laughs> it's like, you're like talking about it. And I'm just like drooling over the opportunity there. But um, I, I'm just really excited to know that, that y'all are out there doing this work and increasing opportunity. I do, I do want to say, I think it needs to start in elementary school you know, and, you know, continue on through educational careers to encourage people with disabilities to focus on STEM, but i um, happy to see it happening in higher ed, like with you too. All right, uh, Alyssa next. So I have to say that I always feel super thankful that my perspective is even considered for panels and opportunities like this, because at the end of the day, I really am only a graduate student. So it really goes to show that having my platform and creating awareness and creating these conversations is making a difference. 
because if I wasn't doing it, would we even be having these conversations on Twitter and all of this and these mentorship movements? So I feel like very privileged and thankful that I've received all the support in order to have the platform that I do have. And I'm so glad that we are having these conversations because if people aren't aware of it, we can't make a change. So having all of this really is gonna make a difference within STEM. And I am thankful for everyone who shows up to these panels besides just the organizers, but also the people who are interested in learning and how can we move beyond something they may have not considered before. So I am hopeful for the future and I know that we could make a change and that I'm only a graduate student and I'm already having the opportunity to do so. So if that inspires other people, so be it because your voice matters at any stage. You don't necessarily need to have a PhD in order to feel like you could critique STEM or be critical of what is currently happening to you and your experience. So thanks. <laughs> thanks, uh, Dr. Marshall. Well, uh, thanks for having me and thanks for pulling this panel together. Um, I think, uh, I guess for my closing remarks, I, I um, want to, you know, thank everybody for inviting me. Um, I also want to um, think about, um, I think one of the important things about um, disability um, as a, you know, a component of DEI is, um, you know, we still, we, you know, we're pushing so hard to get DEI included uh, in these um, in these spaces, in these diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, belonging kind of spaces. Um, but I also, at the same time, we need to kind of flip the lens around um, and make sure that our disability spaces and our disability advocacy spaces are walking that same walk. So, you know, making sure that we're incorporating the lived experiences and the viewpoints of a, of a broad range of humanity um, you know, disability advocacy especially has a long history of sort of a whiteness problem. And I think um, I always take the opportunity, at, at, you know, when I can to point out that I think that's an area that we can always do better in. And um, it's so important to me, part of my passion for disability uh, inclusion is because it cuts across every demographic. There's no demographic there's no identity that disability doesn't touch. And so, you know, it really is this uh, this topic that is relevant and resonant to everyone. And um, I think, you know, we we can be mindful of that. So, you know, kind of this two two way street on disability uh, equity and inclusion uh, in these kind of spaces. And um, yeah, so I just encourage everybody to kind of go back to the, uh, thought we had earlier about looking at unnecessary barriers and, you know, what are, what are some of those unnecessary barriers that you can tackle? Um, and, you know, just little things add up to, to culture change over time. So just think about those little things that you can do different, you know, little barriers you can dismantle, um, voices you can include at the table, you know, little things that you can do to, uh, you know, move this, this, for this, these ideas forward and, and make everything more accessible, inclusive for, for everyone. So. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I do think I would be remiss if I didn't um, acknowledge the first two questions that were put in the Q&A um, to that point that you know, there are absolutely perspectives missing in this panel. And I think that moving forward in this action, um, we can do a better job at representation throughout the whole population because disability does cut across a lot of um, identities. So thank you. Thank you, Emily, for moderating. I know this was um, your first time, so congrats on getting that all done. Uh, thank you all for being here for our second installment. Um, the first thing I want to do is go ahead and say, if you are interested in following any of our panelists today, uh, we have included their Twitter handles, of not only of their personal, but um, their ones that related to their work. Uh, and the website for disruptive inclusion, specifically for Dr. Jennifer Sarrett. Uh, 
we want to share a couple of different upcoming opportunities. The one that you see directly here, if you want to plug in um, to the National Science Policy Network and particularly to our committee with the diversity, equity, inclusion. The next general meeting is November 16th, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, once the time changes and 3 p.m. Pacific Time. You can email DEI at SciPolNetwork.org for more information. I do want to give a shout out to those behind the screens uh, who made this event possible. Dr. Marcy Cockrell is uh, one of our organizers and is behind uh, some of the tech moderation with questions and uh, notes and things like that. Uh, also, some of the additional organizers include Dr. Uh, Jasmine Kimon Yu, uh, Dr. Aditi Sharma Singh, and Thomas Burnett. Uh, so they are all part of the National Science Policy Network, a uh, community of early career researchers interested in uh, advocacy and policy. Um, and so they volunteer their time, uh, many of them who are graduate students or postdoctoral scholars, uh, putting in efforts such as these with their webinar series, including uh, not only this installment, but our first installment around language access. Uh, so you can follow along various social medias as Marcy has put into the chat. Um, and there are plenty of opportunities, not just in this space, but within advocacy, in um, our uh, public engagement in science communication and many other um, affinity groups and committees uh, happy to share. You can explore more at scifallnetwork.org. Uh, the next installment in this series is taking a bit of a pause, but we'll see you back in 2023, uh, where we'll be focusing on STEM and care, so policies around care. Um, thank you, everyone, and have a good one.